Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Peter Goddard, Director of the Institute for Advanced Study. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon to this Institute lecture. Our speaker today is Didier Fassin, who is the James D. Wolfenson Professor in our School of Social Science. At the end of the lecture, there will be an opportunity for questions here, and that will be followed by a reception in the Ford Hall Common Room, to which you're all invited. Didier's research is focused at the intersection of the theoretical and ethnographic foundations of anthropology. Originally trained as a physician, he's conducted field studies in Senegal, Ecuador, South Africa, and France. And these have led to perspectives that have illuminated important aspects of maternal health, social disparities in health, and the AIDS epidemic. He's the author of numerous articles and seven books, including recently, When Bodies Remember, Experiences and Politics of AIDS in South Africa, published in 2007, and The Empire of Trauma, an inquiry into the condition of victimhood, which was published last year. Didier took his doctorate in medicine in 1982, his master's degree in public health in 1986, and his PhD in social science in 1988, all in Paris. He was an assistant professor in infectious diseases and public health from 1987 to 1989, and a senior researcher for the French Institute for Research in the Andes from 1989 to 1991. And then a professor of sociology at the University of Paris North from 1991, as well as being director of studies in political and moral anthropology at the École des Études en Sciences Sociales from 1999. From 2007, he was the founding director of IRIS, the Interdisciplinary Research Institute on Social Issues in Paris. And in the fall of 2009, he joined the institute as the first James D. Wolfenson Professor in social science. Amongst many other responsibilities, Didier was vice president of the French National Committee on AIDS from 2004 to 2006, and vice president of Médecins Sans Frontières from 1999 to 2003. Today, Didier's title is Critique of Humanitarian Reason. <clears throat> Jim just came in. Thank you, Peter, for your presentation. I feel deeply honored to give my first lecture at the Institute for Advanced Study exactly six months after my arrival in Princeton. And I'm very, very grateful to James and Elaine Wolfenson, to my colleagues and friends from here and beyond for their presence tonight. In 1930, Wittgenstein gave a famous lecture on ethics in Cambridge, England, starting with these words, quote, before I begin to speak about my subject proper, let me make a few introductory remarks. I feel I shall have great difficulty in, difficulties in communicating my thoughts to you, and I think some of them may be diminished by mentioning them to you beforehand. The first one, which almost I need not mention, is that English is not my native tongue, and my expression therefore lacks that precision and subtlety which would be desirable if one talks about a difficult subject. The second one is that probably many of you come up to this lecture of mine with slightly wrong expectations." End of quote. <laughs> I, I believe this brilliant precedent allows me to use the same rhetorical preliminary precautions, considering that the author of the Tractatus has first come to Britain two decades earlier. The linguistic ex excuse may serve me for some time. As for tonight, it will at least justify my reading this talk. But considering the Kantian uh, title given to the lecture, my preoccupation will be mostly about the, the possibly wrong expectations 
it may elicit. Actually, the whole lecture will be an attempt to clarify what I mean by this critique of humanitarian reason. The recent earthquake in Haiti certainly brings a particular con context to my reflections. It has provoked a spectacular humanitarian wave, especially in the United States, where the sympathy for the victims has given rise to the mobilization of a considerable amount of private donations as well as public resources. President Obama solemnly declared less than 48 hours after the event that the Asian people would not be forsaken or forgotten. Showing what the New York Times described as, quote, one of the sharpest display of emotion in the presidency, he evoked the suffering endured by the Asian people long before this tragedy and announced he would commit 5,000 troops and $100 million and, quote, more of the people, equipment and capabilities that can make the difference between life and death, unquote. Certainly, this empathy was a message sent to the nation. The contrast was remarkable with his predecessor's indifference to the victims of Katrina. And obviously, this generosity was not exempt of international considerations. After the interventions in Afghanistan and Iraqi inherited, it was time to give the world a different image of the country. As he phrased it, this is one of those moments that calls for American leadership. Many people around the globe, and in Haiti as well, probably shared his view that for geographical as well as historical reasons, the United States should lead the emergency and reconstruction process in the devastated island. A few dissonant voices were heard, however, and four days later, the French Minister of International Cooperation, backed by Doctors Without Borders, bitterly complained about the difficulties encountered by non-US humanitarian workers as priority uh, was given to the arrival of US troops by airport authorities in Port-au-Prince. This is about helping Haiti, not about occupying Haiti. The, uh, uh, the, the, the minister, Alain Joyande, undiplomatically declared in reference to the role played by the United States in Haiti during the first half of the 20th century. Trying to stop the polemic as well as to regain the initiative, President Sarkozy insisted that he was supportive of the US exceptional mobilization, but proposed to, in, to convene an international conference of donors. In the competitive exhibition of compassion and solidarity, France didn't want to be left behind its transatlantic rival. And as you know, the French president spent four hours today in Port-au-Prince. After all, for better or for worse, Haiti is also part of the history and even geography of France. Or more accurately, the pres present Asian situation is a shared legacy of the French colonial oppression and of the American imperial ambition. This Asian scene, which evokes on a larger scale the aftermath of the Hurricane Mitch in Central America, or even more, the tsunami in Southeast Asia, is now part of our moral landscape. We are used to the global spectacle of suffering and to the global display of assistance. We are, we, uh, images of disasters, famines, wars, and of aid organizations, relief operations, and humanitarian uh, interventions have become familiar to us. We live with them. Our relation to these afflictions and their representations is not devoid of ambiguity, though. As St. Augustine lucidly phrased it in his Confessions 16 centuries ago, we are attracted by their vision and like to be moved by it. Quote, in this very sense of grief, our pleasure consists. He writes, even adding, quote, I will... Uh, if goodwill were to be ill will, which it cannot be, only then could he who is truly and sincerely compassionate wish that there, there were some unhappy people so that he might commiserate them." Unquote. But whereas the Bishop of Hippo 
was developing his analysis on moral grounds, I would like to shift mine onto political ones. I'm not so much interested in the individuals watching the news on the television, or sending money for the victims, or even going into the field to help, as I am in what this means for a society as a whole. It's not the psychology of the phenomenon I want to comprehend, but it's sociology and it's anthropology. Compassion is part of politics today. As George W. Bush learned at his expense, he had used for slogan of his first political campaign the expression compassionate conservatism, but in the end appeared to be more conservative than compassionate when it came to the African Americans of devastated Louisiana. Beyond this anecdotal, although significant failure, the question is, why does politics have to be compassionate? Here, the Asian tragedy, or rather the response to it, may enlighten our understanding of humanitarianism. It struck me, as I saw on CNN, Anderson Cooper rescuing an injured boy from violent looters, or Sanjay Gupta operating on a young girl in front of the cameras, a blogger called them saints, another one heroes, or as I heard comments about the concerts, Hope for 80 Now, organized in New York, Los Angeles, London, Paris, on the model of the Teleton, just as it had struck me some years ago when I worked with Doctors of the World or Doctors Without Borders, how much this undoubtedly sincere mobilization of moral sentiments was rewarding not only for those who acted, but more broadly for those who were simply witnessing it. The gratification was collective. For a brief moment, we could have the illusion that we shared a common human condition. We could forget the 30,000 Asians who were on the deportation list of the US Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, or the only 6% of Asian asylum seekers granted the status of refugee in France, which represents one of the lowest national rates far behind apparently peaceful countries like Mali or Senegal. And in fact, as you know, both the United States and France announced their, the interrupted expulsion of undocumented Asians after the earthquake. We could even erase the past, both physically and symbolically, eliminate the traces of the French and later American exploitation of the country. And from that, that perspective, it is remarkable that many analysts today recommend raising Port-au-Prince to the ground in order to completely rebuild the city and maybe the country. This imaginary of the tabula rasa being simultaneously the most benevolent expression of utopian reasoning and the most radical form of historical revisionism. But do not misunderstand me. When analyzing the humanitarian wave in this way, I do not want to minimize the disinterested sentiments and charitable efforts of individuals, organizations, and to a certain point, governments. What I try to underline is that this story is much more about us than about them. Actually, during the past month, we have heard a lot more comments from and about Western actors, their courage, their dedication, their exhaustion, their vision of the disaster and their understanding of the suffering, then we have heard Asian people themselves. We have therefore our words, but we don't have their voice, to paraphrase social anthropologist Vinadas about women victims of violence in India. But what do these words say? They tell us about a collective emotion enabling acts of solidarity, about momentarily abolished frontiers between the miserable South and the rich North, about temporarily suspended tensions, suspicions, and resentment. If AIDS in Haiti was the ferment of reciprocal accusations with the United States, as Paul Farmer has shown, the earthquake brings a dream of reconciliation and a possibility of material and symbolic reparation. Humanitarianism thus embodies a unique moment of secular communion and secular redemption. But the language, the language of a political theology that I'm using here certainly has more to do with Ernst Kantorowicz than with Carl Schmitt.
It restitutes what I see as the profound meaning of contemporary humanitarianism, the space it occupies in politics and the borders it transcends beyond religions. In a study I conducted a few years ago on the response of the Venezuelan government to the deadly landslides that followed heavy rains near Caracas, a disaster known there as La Tragedia, the tragedy, I was struck by the unanimous fervor of a nation united behind its then young leader, Hugo Chavez, to undertake the humanitarian effort as if political tensions could be forgotten, as if the barriers of social classes could be overthrown, thrown, as if the past of a corrupted state could be washed away by the wave of compassion. This consensus, as you know, did not last long. In today's world, where inequalities have reached a probably unprecedented level, humanitarianism thus gives the illusion of a global moral community that may still be viable and the expectation that solidarity may have redeeming powers. This secular imaginary of communion and redemption implies a sudden consciousness of the fundamentally unequal human condition and a moral necessity not to remain passive about it in the name of solidarity. Whatever ephemeral this consciousness is and whatever limited impact this necessity has. This is the weakness of humanitarianism, but also its strength. It apparently and fugaciously bridges the contradictions of our world. It makes the intolerable somewhat bearable, hence its consensual force in the public sphere, hence the difficulty to develop or make acceptable a critique of humanitarian reason. <clears throat> so far, I probably seem to have taken for granted that we all share a common understanding of what humanitarianism is about. It is true up to a certain point. But let me be a little more explicit. By humanitarian reason, I mean the principle under which moral sentiments enter the political sphere. It underlies what may be called a humanitarian government that is a way of governing on this principle. Humanitarian reason is not limited to extreme and remote situations such as disaster areas, war zones, refugee camps, famines, epidemics. It is also at work in misery close to home, whether it affects the homeless or the immigrant, women who have suffered violence, or children living in poverty. All conditions which are often referred to by the bureaucratic word vulnerability. Humanitarian reason is not limited either to non-governmental organizations which claim their monopoly over it. It now involves international institutions, often under the banner of the uh, United Nations, and states, mostly of the Western world, including, the, including their armies deployed in times of peace or war for so-called humanitarian interventions. When I say that moral sentiments enter the political sphere, I should probably add that my understanding of this expression differs somewhat from that of Adam Smith and the 18th century Scottish School of Philosophy. I attach an equal importance to moral and sentiments. Or better said, I consider that humanitarianism is both rational and emotional, both a principle according to which all human beings share a condition that involves a sense of fraternity and an affect by the virtue of which they feel personally concerned by the situation of others. In my view, humanitarianism is about compassion, but also about solidarity. This should hardly be a surprise. The etymology of the French word humanité, and to a lesser degree, its English equivalent humanity, gives us a hint. The notion itself is a modern creation contrasting with previous antonymic divisions of the world between Hellens and barbarians, or Christians and pagans, as German historian Reinhard Koselleck has demonstrated. Let us think, for example, of the debate on the humanity of American Indians during, during the Renaissance. But the word itself has two distinct meanings. On the one hand, it is an ethical 
category that encompasses all human beings and forms the basis of a shared world. It is mankind. On the other hand, it is an emotional movement towards other, toward others and translate into sympathy for their suffering. It is humaneness. The genealogy of humanitarianism is telling as well. It can be traced to the philanthropic mobilization against slavery in France and even more substantially in Britain in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, which was based on rational arguments of human dignity, not excluding more prosaic consideration of economic efficacy. But it can also be traced to the emotional reaction provoked by the atrocities of the battlefield that led to the creation of the International Red Cross at the end of the 19th century. Contemporary humanitarianism is inscribed in this dual etymological and genealogical heritage of rationality and effectivity. To use Martha Nussbaum oxymoron, it is the intelligence of emotions brought into the realm of politics. <clears throat> that humanitarianism is embedded in politics and not separated from it is obvious in the recent international mobilization for Haiti. However, a common tendency among analysts and actors in recent years has been to deny this link. For Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, the quote, separation between politics and humanitarianism, unquote, which means for him the renunciation of politics and the redu its reduction to bare life is the crucial and negative experience of the contemporary world. For Ronnie Broman, a former president of Doctors Without Borders, humanitarianism occupies, quote, the space left empty by politics after the tide of ideology retreated, which in his mind implies a positive move toward a more ethical world. What I defend here is, on the contrary, that humanitarian reason has become part of our making of politics. In his course at the Collège de France on the birth of biopolitics, Michel Foucault described the modern government emerging in the 18th century as a combination of a police state, which he saw as the activities of controlling and securitizing populations, and of a liberal regime, which he understood as the introduction of the economic into the field of power. My argument is that a third pillar should be added to the police state and the liberal economy to describe contemporary politics, that is humanitarian reason. Certainly it is the weakest of the three, but as I have said before, it is this weakness that is the source of its strength. It brings a moral sense to politics, although not without some ambiguity. And indeed, humanitarian reason and moral sentiments may be manipulated. In October 1990, the revelation of a tearful nurse that hundreds of newborn Kuwaitis had died as a result of their incubators being switched off by Iraqi soldiers was a turning point in the mobilization of uh, Americans in favor of the war against Saddam Hussein. It was learned sometime later, sometime later that the story had been invented and the supposed nurse was the daughter of the ambassador of Kuwait in Washington. But the first Gulf War had already started. In October 2001, the the operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan combined bombing of strategic sites and airdrops of so-called humanitarian packages. Several non-governmental organizations saw this association as a dangerous confusion and during the following month, several killings and kidnappings of humanitarian workers occurred as if the Taliban did not see any difference between them and the occupying military. I'm therefore not asserting that humanitarianism replaces realpolitik. But its efficacy as argument, or as rhetoric, elicits a question which is similar to the one Albert Hirschman asked about the moral success of capitalism. Why does it work so well? Why do states need this ethical disguise to justify their military action? Why do we hear today more about humanitarian intervention than about what Michael Walzer analyzed not so long ago as just wars? In its broader meaning, humanitarianism can be understood, I propose, as an ideology. 
but neither, neither in the Marxist sense of an illusion created by the dominants to dissimulate their domination to the dominated, nor in the Weberian sense of, in, of an instrument legitimizing the, uh, the authority to gain uh, the adhesion of subjects without using force. It is rather an ideology, as Clifford Goertz defined it, that is, a cultural system, the function of which is, quote, to make an autonomous politics possible by providing the authoritative concept that render it meaningful, the suasive images by means of which it can be sensibly grasped, unquote. In other words, it is what we have come to take for granted as highly valuable in politics. The question is therefore, what are these authoritative concepts and suasive images that make humanitarian reason so powerful and so consensual? So consensual? I believe the force of humanitarianism resides in the simple but potent message it carries. Its fundamental and ultimate justification is saving lives. It is from this perspective that not only non-governmental organizations such as the Red Cross or Action Against Hunger have justified their existence, but also states increasingly justify their intervention to protect populations in Kosovo, as in Kosovo, when NATO bombings were presented as a humanitarian war by Czech President Václav Havel, or even to rescue individuals, as in Colombia, when French President Nicolas Sarkozy sent a so-called humanitarian mission for the liberation of Ingrid Betancourt from the FARC guerrilla. The moral profit <clears throat> of the qualification humanitarian is such that it may be used extensively and sometimes cynically to justify any sort of action, including paradoxically the use of armed force. Who could be against the noble goal of saving lives? As political scientist and former UN consultant Thomas Weiss affirms, quote, humanity or the sanctity of life is the only genuine first order principle of intervention. The protection of the right to life, broadly interpreted, belongs to the category of obligations whose respect is in the interest of all states. Others, including the sacred trio of neutrality, impartiality, and consent, as well as legalistic interpretations of the desirability about UN approval, are second, second order principles." Unquote. Following this line, it is easy to see how the international order can be shaken by the interruption of humanitarian reason as a supreme argument. The representation of the world that logically derives from this affirmation relies on a tripartite division between those who take lives, those whose life are endangered, and those who save lives, the military, the victims, and the humanitarians. This is the description Jean-Hervé Bradol, former president of Doctor Without Borders, recently proposed, quote, the production of a global order demands its quota of victims. Are all these deaths necessary? Is the, question we, is the question we systematically address to political powers. Why? Because we have taken the arbitrary and radical decision to help the people society is willing to sacrifice." Unquote. This Manichaean view of a cannibal order, as he calls it, is certainly extreme, but coming from a Nobel Peace Prize laureate, it should seize our attention. The Second Gulf War provided this non-governmental organization the occasion to defend its position. On the 18th of March 2003, as George W. Bush solemnly called on Saddam Hussein to leave Iraq within 48 hours, it became clear that foreign workers still present in the country had very little, little time to decide whether they wanted to be evacuated or not. In the heated debate, that took place in the Doctors Without Borders headquarters in Paris, the decision took a dramatic turn. Five members of the organization, including the international president, had gone to Baghdad in anticipation of the conflict and to prevent its consequences. However, it became obvious that their efficacy would be extremely limited. The Iraqi capital, 
counted 35 hospitals and hundreds of doctors, surgeons, and anesthesiologists, 60 alone in the hospital where the small humanitarian team intended to work. In this context, of course very different from Africans one, for instance, the reason to stay could not reasonably be saving Iraqi's life. It was symbolic, being there is a leitmotiv of humanitarian organizations, but also it was ethical by endangering their own lives, the aid workers expressed their ultimate solidarity with the Iraqis they considered would be sacrificed during the war. The intense bombing of Baghdad actually started two days later. The five humanitarian workers were trapped in their hotel. At some point, two were abducted. Doctors Without Borders announced they were suspending their activities, which in fact had not started. When the two hostages were released, it appeared that they had been arrested by the Iraqi police who thought they belonged to the foreign intelligence services. By that time, the US Army was entering Baghdad along with dozens of aid workers. Deeply traumatized by the kidnapping, Doctors Without Borders chose to leave the country, declaring in contrast to with most non-governmental organizations present in Iraq that there was no humanitarian crisis. This, this episode is telling of the contradictions and even aporia of their worldview. According to them, in the violent international order, some states and their armies sacrificed while others, civilian victims, were sacrificed. To defend the sacredness of life, the humanitarian workers were therefore theoretically ready to engage themselves in a potential sacrifice of their life. When effectively endangered, they however decided to leave without having saved one single life. This was indeed a cruel lesson about the fragility of humanitarianism, which always depends on the belligerents' goodwill, their passive or active protection, their authorized corridors, their benevolence. Certainly, the ideology I've started to ca characterize takes here a peculiar expression, adopting a Christ-like representation of the world with a combat between good and evil, the theme of the sacrifice, and the image of the savior. But I believe it accentuates, rather than it distorts, the moral core of humanitarianism and its link with religion. After all, Florence Nightingale and Henri Dunant acted in the name of their Christian faith, and the Red Cross is a cross. The question, however, is how does humanitarian ideology work when it is confronted by the principle of reality? Specialists of international re relations often describe this confrontation in terms of moral or ethical dilemmas. In fact, in most cases, the question, questions are raised in the course of action and rarely take the form of real dilemmas implying previous deliberation. I prefer, therefore, to talk of stakes, which often become only visible afterwards. <coughs> the intervention in Kosovo illustrates how the moral division of the world resists with difficulty this truth ordeal. Firstly, the radical separation between armed forces and humanitarian workers does not easily hold. A few days after the beginning of the bombings of Kosovo by NATO aircraft, Doctors Without Borders made a highly publicized report on the violence exerted by the Serbs against the Kosovars. The document was immediately used by the spokesperson of the military forces as evidence of the humanitarian justification of the war. Military and humanitarian actors appeared as objective allies. A regrettable confusion that the president of Doctors Without Borders, Philip Biberson, later recognized. The conflict yielded more examples of collaboration and even sometimes complicity with the armed forces, such as in the case of a Canadian organization that was discovered to be serving as an intelligence agency for uh, NATO. But beyond this specific situation, the parallel between military and humanitarian actors reveals remarkable structural similarities. Both share the same temporality of emergency as they enter and leave the country almost simultaneously. Both share the same habitus of distinction between the local people, from, distinction from the local people living in separate guarded quarters. 
both share the same technologies of managing population rather than dealing with individuals, and both may even share some goals such as relief or assistance to civilians. Actually, humanitarian workers resemble the military to a greater extent than they admit or imagine, a situation which may become a two-edged two sword as belligerents sometimes do not differentiate them. Secondly, the recognition of victims is far from being as simple as suggested by the humanitarian creed. It may even sometimes become conflictive. At the end of the bombings of Kosovo, when NATO opened corridors of assistance, the Greek branch of Doctors Without Borders decided to send exploratory teams to Pristina, but also to Belgrade, whose population had been severely affected. This position, which was in fact coherent with the geopolitical affinities between the Greeks and the Serbs, was condemned by the rest of the organization. As the dissident branch did not renounce its project, it was excluded from the international movement, an unprecedented sanction in the history of Doctors Without Borders. Whereas a consensus existed among and within humanitarian organizations on the necessity, as Doctor of the, Doctors of the World phrased it, to help the victims, all the victims, it became clear that how to define legitimate victims could be also problematic. A confirmation emerged a few months later when the Kosovo Albanians started to exert violence against the Kosovo Serbs and Doctors Without Borders decided to close their eyes regarding this new ethnic, cleans regarding this new ethnic cleansing. In sum, neither the moral distinction between military and humanitarians nor the moral construction of the category of victims was so simple to achieve. The humanitarian world itself appeared to be much less homogeneous and consensual than what would, one could believe. During the winter of 2003, as the US government was trying to rally the Congress about the so-called evidence of weapons of mass destruction, humanitarian organizations divided themselves in two international fronts. On the one side, an important coalition, including doctors of the world, was opposed to military intervention, arguing that it could provoke a humanitarian crisis. On the other side, several organizations, including Doctors Without Borders, declared that they were neither pro-war nor anti-war and reiterated that humanitarian organizations were supposed to remain neutral only at the service of victims. The former, the Doctors of the World side, are sometimes pejoratively referred to as human rightists, droit de l'homiste, whereas the latter, Doctors Without Borders side, call themselves aidists, secouristes. In this particular case, there was in fact another side, a third man, so to speak, rather isolated, Bernard Kouchner, who was the co-founder of both organizations. He was officially in favor of the US intervention to get, rid, to get rid of the Iraqi dictator, as he argued. The spectrum of potential political position and moral justification is therefore quite wide, going in this case from pacifism to uh, war mongering or uh, support to war. Tensions often arise from these divergences. In July 2001, Doctors Without Borders made public a report denouncing the false normalization of the post-war situation in Angola. They accused the government, the UNITA rebels, the United Nations, and the whole international community as being accomplices in a terrible humanitarian crisis in which thousands of people were dying. The UN humanitarian coordinator had to respond to justify the action of his workers, all aiming for the same objective, he said, saving the lives of people who would otherwise suffer or die. These examples demonstrate that the humanitarian world functions, as one could imagine, as a social field in Pierre Bourdieu's sense, that is, as a social space in which individuals and groups compete 
not only to gain access to scarce resources, but also, and more importantly, to define the legitimate issues that are at stake and the rest responses to be provided. However, seen through the eyes of certain organizations, this world sometimes resembles Dante's Inferno with its multiple circles of infamy descending from merely dubious companion, the other humanitarian workers, to potential war criminals, the states and their armies, passing by a variety of compromised do-gooders and critical intellectuals. But humanitarian workers do not only save lives, they also bear witness. It is often considered that contemporary humanitarianism started when the silence maintained by the Red Cross in the name of neutrality from Nazi extermination camps to the atrocious Biafran war became intolerable. Doctors Without Borders, later Doctors of the, of the World, and many others, including Oxfam most notably, began testifying against the violence and violations they witnessed all over the world. By doing so, they adopted the position of spokespersons for those who were supposedly deprived of public expression. Undoubtedly, human organizations have a legitimacy to allow them to shed light on, uh, that allows them to shed light on the misfortunes, injustices, and persecutions endured by population because of disasters, famines, and wars. They certainly have access to the global public sphere from which these populations are excluded. When they defend their causes, however, they translate social realities into other social realities. They transform combatants or civilians into victims. They change their experience of violence and violations into suffering. Humanitarian psychiatry has played a crucial role in this, in this process, particularly through the importation of the category of trauma. Nowhere was it more evident than in the Palestinian territories during the Second Intifada. Doctors Without Borders and Doctors of the World, but also Palestinian organizations, developed important mental health programs, as did Israeli organizations on their side. But facing the impossibility of providing psychological care because of the precarious conditions of their action, they used their expertise to bear witness to the tragedies with which they were confronted. They publicly spoke of the anxieties, nightmares, stress, and most of all, trauma. They reported that children and adolescents were often suffering from enuresis. As a French journalist wrote, quote, the Shebab who throw stones at Israeli soldiers during the day, often wet their bed at night, in an expression of the fear they repressed a few hours earlier. These symptoms was revealed by mother who confided in psychologists sent out by humanitarian organizations." End quote. It may be that the vulnerable teenager wetting his bed arouses more consensual sympathy than the aggressive stone thrower. It is likely, however, that in the translation of his acts of resistance into symptoms of trauma, something is lost of the meaning he intends to give to his life, but also of our possible understanding of the situation. If, as Anna Arendt suggests, the specificity of human life is that it is, quote, full of events which ultimately can be told as a story, unquote. In other words, if it is not just biology, but also biography. It is this lived individual experience and its possible extension into a collective history that vanish in the process. Beyond this specific Palestinian case, it is clear that humanitarianism, by its logics of emergency, suspends both individual and collective times, biography and history. In conclusion, the critique of the humanitarian reason I have developed here has certainly put me on a dangerous path. Because of the value it defends and because of the aura associated with it, humanitarianism has gained a form of moral intangibility. The superior virtue it represents has made it untouchable. We are all convinced of the good it does to the world, 
But my analysis has not questioned the moral intentions of humanitarian workers or even of politicians using humanitarian arguments to justify their policies. I have limited, I have limited it to two questions. First, what does our relying increasingly on humanitarian reason to make policies mean for contemporary societies? And second, to what tensions, contradictions, and even aporia does humanitarian government lead? Considering Plato's allegory of the cave, I could say I have tried to answer the first interrogation by stepping outside of the cave to see what was not immediately visible, the signification of humanitarianism, and I've tried to answer the second interrogation by going back inside the cave where humanitarian workers carry out their mission. The critique thus produced may therefore be seen as that of a distanced insider or an informed outsider, in both cases attempting to explore what could be called, paraphrasing Joseph Conrad, the heart of humanness. I started this lecture with the recent catastrophic events in Haiti. Moving from the global scene to the local one, let me end with the almost intimate evocation of a young Asian woman I met a few years ago in France. I will call her Marie. This is the story she told me. During the 1990s, at the climax of civil unrest and paramilitary violence in Haiti, her father, who was a political opponent, was murdered by unknown assailants, and sometimes later, her mother disappeared and was thought to have been killed. One day, a group of men burst into Marie's house and gang raped her in front of her boyfriend. In the following days, after having found temporary refuge at her aunt's, she decided to leave her country and seek asylum in France. But considering they did not have sufficient evidence of the persecution she had endured and of the risk she would incur if she returned to Haiti, the French Office for the Protection of Refugees and later the Court of Appeal for Refugees denied her asylum. Having become an undocumented immigrant with no relatives in France, she suffered from increasing isolation and depression. At some point, she was brought to the hospital in a state of profound physical and psychological deterioration. The doctor diagnosed full-blown AIDS, probably a consequence of the rape. He prepared a medical dossier for the immigration service. In effect, an article had been recently added in French immigration legislation providing that foreigners with a serious disease which could not be treated in their home countries could receive a temporary residence permit and get free treatment in hospital. As a Kenyan engineer also suffering from AIDS who had been illegally in France for years and finally obtained his permit because of his medical condition, told me once, this disease that kills me is also what allows me to live. Marie was legalized under this criterion known in French as humanitarian reason. Réseau humanitaire. What she had not been able to get as a right had finally been given to her by compassion. She was only one of the many asylum seekers who after being, turn, being turned down by the institution in charge of refugees received residence permits because of their medical condition. In France, during the past three decades, the proportion of those granted asylum by the Office of the, for the Protection of Refugees decreased 18-fold, whereas in the last 10 years, the number of immigrants legalized in the name of humanitarian reason also multiplied by 18, the other way. Since the early uh, 2000, for the first time in France, more immigrants have received documents based on medical grounds than under the Geneva Convention. The compassionate argument outweighs here the political right. However specific this case may be and also the national context in which it is embedded, I guess it is significant of a broader shift in our moral economies. In the tension between what German sociologist Georg Simmel describes as entitlement and obligation, in other words, 
between right and compassion, we are today more inclined to move from the former entitlement to the latter obligation. Humanitarianism has become our ultimate language to speak of the violence and the inequality of the world, to qualify difficult issues like military operations or immigration policies, and even to make lost causes more audible, as in the case of Marie, who had failed all the tests of asylum. From a pragmatic perspective, one could certainly argue that the important point, point is that, in the end, she did obtain a legal status. It may be, however, that being recognized as a person living with AIDS worthy of compassion or as a refugee deserving political protection makes a substantial subjective difference. It may also be that having one's body certified by medical experts rather than being trusted for one's word represents a significant loss of dignity. It may finally be that our society acknowledging humanitarian reasons more than asylum has more profound consequences than what we would think. Establishing that these anthropological details actually matter for democracy and showing that what we take for granted morally may be politically problematic could be a, a good raison d'etre for critical social sciences. Thank you. Time for a question. <clears throat> yes, I don't know if there's a microphone. If you could wait. Thank you. Hi. So my question has to do with uh, MSF's neutral position towards war. I was wondering whether the reason that MSF presents itself as being neutral towards war is not so much that it doesn't want to take a moral stand against war, which is such an important determinant of poor health, but rather that if it does take a stand, then it might risk not being able to allow entry into certain countries where there are vulnerable people. So. Uh, internally, it, it might have a moral stand, but it's making a more external statement of neutrality to ensure that it has access to the people it wants to help. Yeah, you, you're, uh, you're right that neutrality is, uh, is uh, an element of the creed and very often of the charter of most uh, humanitarian organizations. In the case of Doctors Without Borders, it is. Uh, and you're right also that to intervene uh, in uh, uh, situations of war, uh, humanitarian organizations need uh, the protection of both belligerent when there are two. And, uh, and so they need uh, hum what, what is sometimes called as uh, so, uh, humanitarian corridors, for example. I think in that case, because the, there was no more problem for the first side uh, than for the second side to be involved, and there was no reason why there would be uh, a difference. I mean, the United States, for example, or the other countries uh, go, uh, going into Iraq uh, with the United States um, did not uh, have the idea of uh, preventing these organizations against war, against war to, uh, to intervene. No, I think that was more fundamentally uh, not necessarily a moral stance. It was, uh, it, it, it was a principle that was uh, presented as the core of their definition of being secourist, that is, that are translated by aidists, uh, which in fact uh, has the ironical effect 
that Doctors Without Borders in the present time is much closer to the Red Cross, for example, than it is from uh, other organizations who are more involved in human rights. But again, my, uh, uh, when, I, when I gave this example of the Iraq war, giving three positions, in fact, two main positions to be, which I think were the most interesting because one was being against the war, uh, because, but not, be, be, not being against the war as such, but being against the war because of the, its humanitarian consequences uh, that could be anticipated. Uh, and, and the other one being neither for nor against, uh, and even uh, showing some irony against the, the, the other ones, um, and, uh, but, but, uh, but, but defending a position which would be uh, war is not our question. Our question is to take care of the victims or the wounded uh, after the, uh, uh, or the refugees uh, after the war. Thank you. Down, down what? Downtrodden. Uh, people who are, are devalued by uh, their governments or uh, the warring faction that's coming in. Um, how do you change the opinion of that faction to allow you to uh, aid these people? <clears throat> First of all, the humanitarian organizations uh, do not try to change the mind of the belligerents, uh, and especially when these belligerents are uh, exerting repression and violence and persecutions on their populations or on other populations. So they do not try. I mean, that's not, that's not a point. Uh, and, but second, what is interesting and what your question uh, raises is that it's, it can be surprising that in most conflicts in the world, we have very few exceptions, uh, the belligerents accept the principle of a humanitarian intervention. Of course, you could name exceptions. You could name kidnapping in Chechnya. You could name killing in Sri Lanka uh, or uh, other, uh, other events of the, of, the, of the kind. But uh, the... Uh, uh, the, and, and, and I will say something about that, uh, but uh, the, in most situations, what is surprising is that considering the violence of the, uh, of the war, considering the, uh, the lack of respect of human rights or uh, people's rights uh, from some of the belligerents or many of the belligerents, uh, it's, it's always very uh, uh, remarkable that humanitarian uh, organizations or some human, United Nations as well uh, could, could intervene uh, on, the, on the battlefield. And I think that's why I, I talk about moral landscapes. I, I think that is something that at some point it becomes very difficult as a state or as an army to refuse uh, completely that, whatever uh, the conflict is. We have counter examples. Uh, and I, I don't want to, to be polemical about that, but uh, it, that's, that's a general rule. Uh, I said I, I wanted to go back on the point of uh, uh, kidnapping and killing. What is uh, uh, extremely uh, interesting and probably sad is that if you analyze killings and kidnappings uh, in humanitarian organization, you realize that uh, those who are kidnapped are always expatriates. Uh, 
they are people coming from mostly from Western countries and working uh, in as humanitarian workers. But what uh, we often forget is that the majority of humanitarian workers are local workers in all countries. Uh, and the, they, these are those who are, uh, who are killed. They are not kidnapped, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, revealing of the fact that uh, there is uh, a, a very little value of the local lives, uh, but there is a highly valued, not for moral reason, but for economic, economic reason, uh, a kidnapping of a humanitarian worker is one million euro a ransom. So it's, uh, it's, it's significant uh, in the war effort. First of all, uh, and, and to make uh, this uh, point very clear, I don't have a teleological view of, of, of that history uh, or that story, simply. Uh, I do not mean that this is the way uh, we, uh, the, the, we, we're going toward a sort of humanitarian world. That's not at all what I, what I said or what I want to say. What I, what I, no, 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 but it, you, you, that, that's important to, 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 to give this idea that uh, I'm talking of a, about a present moment uh, in which some elements which have echoes in the past uh, and do not tell us much about the future uh, are occurring. So in, in this context, uh, I think you have different elements. One is, uh, I would say, long-term changes and, and uh, and, and the, the place of moral issues in, in, uh, in the, and the way you can play or act on the emotion and the reason of uh, public opinion or, or the, your constituency, uh, whatever camp you are, you are uh, in, whether you are conservative or you are progressive, you, uh, you, whether you are on the right or on the left in France, uh, you cannot avoid the humanitarian question. That is, even if you are having uh, a, a very restrictive and repressive immigration policy, as we have in France right now, you have to show that uh, humanitarian uh, reason is respected uh, up, up to a certain point. Uh, so, <clears throat> so that's why I, I talked about language, I talked about value, uh, that was... Uh, so one element is this, is a... Uh, a shift uh, 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 which, which probably has a, lo a, a, a long history as I, as I try to, 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 to show uh, going back to the uh, 18th and 19th century. But <clears throat> the other one, the other element that may give a specific tone to the French context, because I know that uh, it, it would, I couldn't tell the same story uh, in, in the United States probably, and uh, not exactly the same one in many European countries either. Uh, <clears throat> I think what, what has played a specific role are non-governmental organizations and social mobilization more generally around these issues, especially around AIDS, uh, in the case of some of them, but also the, 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 the increasing role uh, played by uh, these uh, <clears throat> uh, humanitarian uh, workers in politics. Uh, uh, at least four or five of them have, be, have been uh, ministers and not, not necessarily, uh, uh, and, and on the right as on the, way, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the left, and sometimes like Bernard Kouchner on the left and then later on the right. So, <clears throat> uh, so, so that, 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 that means that it goes across the political uh, border. 
but but it, it is a, a potent uh, 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 both movement and then infiltration of the uh, even of the uh, of the state itself. Uh, some people, for example, have become uh, uh, high um, uh, civil servants in in the administration. For example. Yeah, well, I perfectly understand what you what you mean, and I, or I think, uh, I've tried not to. Uh, uh, well, I tried to be critical in the sense that I uh, gave in the end, that is, trying to move from the outside to the inside of the cave and trying to um, uh, to. To give instruments to analyze uh, situations which were uh, often simplified, uh, whether in the public sphere or within the organization themselves, uh, and and also uh, I defend the idea, as I said before, that uh, it is still politics, and uh, I, I would say there's a, a continuity of of politics with different. Uh, 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 different moments, but also different values and different uh, uh, elements that are constitutive. I, I always think of Paul Venn, uh, uh, the French historian, uh, talking about depoliticization in the Roman Empire and saying, you know, it's being, uh, we've had depoliticization for uh, uh, all the time, and if, all the time that's a polemical uh, way of, uh, of uh, addressing the politics, it is the way it is done. So, um, <clears throat> so I, I would, I would, I wouldn't go as far as to say that uh, it uh, it is it is not politics or it is a loss of politics. I think it's, it's a change of politics. I think uh, uh, the the kind of solidarity and and uh, even if it has an emotional comp co component. Uh, is, uh, is, is something that uh, can be uh, interesting in terms of uh, inhabiting uh, uh, the uh, 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 politics uh, today. So um, I am critical in the sense that I've tried to, uh, to, to, to give to, the, to this talk. Uh, but I, I, I think we have to, uh, uh, to, to think not only of what's lost, as I insisted in the end in the translation, but also what's gained in the translation. And I, uh, and, and I think it's uh, not as negative as you, as you would assume. Yes? When the uh, argument was around just war or unjust war, sorry, there were rules of conduct of, lo of war so that um, even the Geneva Convention, if you think in contemporary times, as those were uh, overlooked or stepped over, and it was always, and it was civilians and children and elderly and, you know, mass things like our bombing of uh, Japan, uh, didn't the need, wasn't the space opened for somehow maintaining through the humanitarian efforts that there was a, a moral component or a uh, to war. I mean, that, that people, that countries were, who would go do that, 
and step over all the um, formally accepted conventions of war, would need, as human societies, to um, take care of the victims in some way or another in order not to recognize that war was no longer being argued about just or unjust. <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand your question, but just to, um, okay. to, to, to try to, make, uh, to, to propose an answer. Uh, <clears throat> If one of your points is that is to ask whether moral arguments were uh, used and, and enforced in, in wars uh, in the past, uh, obviously, and probably some of us here would be uh, better equipped than I am for, for, for that. Uh, but um, uh, so, so what? Uh, but, but, but still, there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a history of it, and there's a history uh, of uh, how people should uh, behave, not only in declaring war, war, that is, in making just wars, but how they do, do they behave on, on the battlefield. And, and, and here, uh, the first humanitarianism, uh, uh, the, that of the Red Cross and, and afterwards, uh, uh, introduces, uh, I think, a, a, a significant rupture. <clears throat> I was just thinking the people involved in wars, there were, there were boundaries for a long time, that it was soldiers who fought, and that the civilians weren't indiscriminately bombed or anything. Wasn't that true through the <coughs> history of war? Or you're talking more about political you know, advantage today. Yeah. Our, our historians <laughs> could talk about you know, how civilians were yeah. respected or not. Uh, yes, in thank you. medieval wars, for example, or Thank you. They would answer better than I would do. Uh, well, <laughs> sorry to <clears throat> Avi. Yeah. yeah. You showed lots of pictures in your uh, presentation, but you didn't talk about the role of the media in uh, determine, determining really what, what, is, uh, what constitutes a place where humanitarian action is needed. Uh, I guess neither of the political manipulation of the media in order to gather public support for uh, you know, yeah. actions that have nothing to do with humanitarianism. Yeah, uh, you're right that I didn't... I didn't uh, Make a special um, element in the, in the in my analysis about uh, about media uh, uh, because that was not my point. But you're right that it's it's very important, and I gave several anecdotal elements, uh, either from CNN today or from uh, the, um, the, uh, the the previous, uh, the previous the two uh, Gulf Wars to show how it could how this the question of uh, the image, the representation, uh, is, is important. However, my question is, uh, uh, is, is not so much, although it's quite important, is not so much uh, uh, that the, about manipulation uh, that it is about, than it is about uh, the efficacy. Uh, so, uh, in order to manipulate, you have to, to use the good, uh, the good arguments or the good images, and, and, I, and that's what interests me. What, what are the good images and what are the good uh, arguments? Uh, and, <clears throat> and I think it's not just about manipulation. It can be, as I said, uh, but it's, it's more uh, of a common sense that we, that we have. That's why I talked about ideology in the sense uh, that was not polemical as Marx or, to a certain degree, Weber would uh, say it. Maybe 
Yeah. <clears throat> yeah well, uh, the <clears throat> the this uh, uh, this allegory of the cave uh, is of course uh, 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 a way of uh, trying to give an account a posteriori of what I uh, didn't analyze this way a priori. Uh, and the, uh, but, but for me it is, it is important and as you saw, uh, I didn't say it, but as you saw on the slide, uh, I, I, I think it's very important to be on the threshold uh, of, of the cave, that is to, to, go, to be able to go outside and to, be, to go back inside. And, uh, <clears throat> And I, I, I think uh, uh, there's a, 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 a um, tradition of critique which, which is the strongest tradition of critique which has been outside uh, of, the, um, of the cave. Uh, and that's what Michael Walzer has written about. Uh, uh, and uh, and, and I, I think it's important to keep that. But at the same time, uh, it's important also to be aware that the uh, that people who are in the cave are very often trying to do their best, very often uh, more intelligent than uh, and more critical than what we may think, and so maybe you can bring some light from the outside, but you have be, you have to be very uh, very. Uh, uh, respectful also or careful uh, with the way you treat those who, who are inside. Uh, so I, I, I don't have this sort of uh, um, superior view of, of, of what critique is. I think it's really on the border, on, on the, that's Michel Foucault who was uh, using this expression uh, uh, or this uh, metaphor uh, um, based on his analysis of Kant's uh, uh, what, what is enlightenment? Let me remind you at this point that we can continue now the discussion over in the reception uh, in Ford Hall, and let me invite you to, again to thank Didier for an excellent lecture. Thank you.